very confusing for us to, to read this. And Lord, I, I pray that you help me to explain this properly and that um, there's no way I'm going to be able to touch every base on this, but help me to explain what you want us to understand today. And this we ask and we pray for the Lord's name. Amen. Okay, so in this section that we're on today, in verse 19, there's a question there. And it's, why then was the law given at all? If Abraham was considered righteous by believing God, as we had discussed, it, it's a very good question, and I hope that I can explain this clearly. Now, as a little back, um, we'll kind of do a little uh, recap of where we've been. So we're in Galatians 3, and Paul is beginning beginning this series of arguments um, to the Christians in Galatia. And Paul wants to help them understand why what the Judaizers were teaching was false. The Judaizers had agreed that all should believe in Jesus, um, but they said that the Galatians, because they were Gentile, they had to uh, follow the law. Meaning at this time we're talking about that, having to be circumcised in order to be truly saved. So they're trying to convert them over to Judaism first. And that's the way they're arguing about that. So Paul, he's already attacked this from um, two directions so far that we've already discussed. First he talked about, uh, he pointed it out to the Galatians, their own personal experience, right? Uh, they received the Holy Spirit after trusting in Jesus Christ and before they did any works of the law. So, um, And they were Gentiles, so keep that in mind. So they really had no history. They didn't really have any knowledge of the Israeli laws. So um, why would they begin to think now that they needed to be circumcised and start following the law? They already had salvation through belief. And then second, we covered this last week, was Paul was arguing with the Old Testament scriptures that uh, God's word has always taught that there is salvation by faith. And he's been, uh, he started that with the declaration that Abraham was declared righteous or justified for believing the Lord. And we covered that last week then. In fact, the following, the following law reveals that if you're following the law, it reveals that you are under a curse for breaking the law. So the law shows us that we cannot uphold it. So there's no way to obtain salvation. And he's seen as righteous or justified through the law because it's impossible for man to follow. And we can only become justified or have that salvation uh, through faith in Jesus' death in our place. And we can all uh, become Abraham's children then, right? Because he believed in faith. Because we believe by faith we are then Abraham's children. And we're included into the God's family. So I hope you're all with me so far. So that's what we've talked about the last couple of weeks. Okay, so the issue today is this. Um, I'm going to simplify. Stupid, but I don't get this anyway. So, we, if you can imagine, there's a road map, okay? And on this road map, there's only one road, and the road is in the shape of a Y, okay? So it's like this, right? A road here, a road here, and they join to, for like the letter I. So, let's see if I can. Remember, all analogies are not perfect, so. <laughs> Okay, so on this road here, we'll call this Faith Drive, and on Faith Drive is Abraham, and he's driving a Cutlass Supreme Broham, because it rhymes with Abraham. And on this road here are the Judaizers, and they're driving a Mercury Bonnier, and you can imagine it's driving, and it's got smoke coming out the windows, it's got loud trumpet music. <laughs> okay, in this, in the law, in 
count them, know this. So, long thing here. <laughs> anyway, so you got these two groups, right? And they're all driving here, and they're going to intersect here at a road called the part of the Y that goes down. Let's call that Salvation or Justification Drive. Let's call that, right? So they come here and they have an accident, and there's a big accident, and there's parts and pieces of cars all over the place. So at this intersection, grace with Abraham, right? Faith and uh, the law, they collide. And they're having an argument at this intersection of who has the right of way. Who had who can go on to righteous boulevard? Let's call it that. Okay, so it's kind of an oversimplified thing of what's going on here. Now, God had made an unconditional covenant, or we can call it a promise, to Abraham. Then centuries later, God had given the commandment to Moses, okay? And those are known as the Law of Moses, and the Judaizers would go on to say that by giving the Law of Moses, it weakened or nullified the Abraham Covenant, okay? And then that kind of introduced in righteousness by works mixed with faith, mixed with faith okay? Does that make sense? Now, in verse 15, it says, Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God by and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in this grace gave to Abraham through a promise. Okay? Now, in these verses, we see a lot the word promise. The promise that's being spoken about here is God's promise to Abraham that in him, meaning Abraham, all the nations were going to be blessed. Okay? So these are promises are eternal blessings. God promised to Abraham and his offspring. So these blessings are not given on the basis of Abraham's deeds. They're not giving on the basis of Abraham's actions. Instead, it comes to all who believe by faith in Christ. Okay? So he describes the covenant promise made that uh, Abraham, Paul is, as an inheritance. That's, that's something that's passed down from one person to the next person to his or her offspring, right? Their inheritance was given by God's promise. Christ, then, is being the seed, right? He's the ultimate offspring of Abraham. And he's entitled to everything that was promised to Abraham. So, by extension, we go back to that again, right? So, everyone, by extension, who is in Christ is entitled to those promises through God's Son, Jesus Christ. So, the promises that, give, that God gave Abraham, our example would be here in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. I hope I'm not losing you. It says, The Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, 
and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. There's a lot of I wills in there, right? There's no Abraham, you do this. It's all I will do that. So this promise that's given to Abraham involved Abraham being justified by faith. And that justification translates into having all the blessings of salvation. Now, if you remember, we covered a couple weeks ago in Galatians 3, uh, verses 6 through 9. And in that it said, So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Now this promise was given to Abraham and to his seed, like I've said already. It's singular, it's not plural. It refers to Jesus Christ as being the seed. And that all these blessings would be made possible. Okay? Now, we kind of come back to the, what the real argument that uh, what Paul is giving as an argument is kind of foreseeing what these Judaizers are going to come up with. So he's already giving the answers already. So the issue is this. This promise to Abraham, it was given around 2000 B.C. Centuries go by. The Israelites are held in captivity in Egypt. And then they wander around in the wilderness for a while. And during that time in the wilderness, the law is given to Moses. Also, we refer to as the, the law of Moses, the Mosaic law. Okay? So the Mosaic law refers to the laws God had given Moses on Mount Sinai. So that includes like the Ten Commandments, uh, the ordinances for uh, living in society, the regulations of their worship, uh, requirements for their priests, the sacrifices, the feasts, the temples, all that stuff, okay? Those are a lot of Moses. And this occurred around 1450 B.C. So the covenant with Abraham, 2000 B.C., a lot of Moses came in existence around 1450 B.C. That is the issue. The Judaizers, realizing that the law was given to Moses several centuries after the promise to Abraham, the law then changed the promise according to the Judaizers. Okay? In other words, it changed the covenant between Abraham and God when the law came along. And Paul disagrees with that thought process. And in our text in verse 15, Paul says this, Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. Paul begins verse 15 by giving an example of a covenant or a promise between two people. Uh, he places this example in earthly terms, right? A covenant or a promise between two people. Uh, and he says that a covenant or a promise cannot be changed by a third party, okay? So if you think of it like this, it's uh, the third party, and this would have been Moses, right? There was an agreement between God and Abraham. Moses comes along. Moses cannot change that covenant. Does that make sense? It's like this with your home mortgage, I guess, also. Uh, you agreed upon a contract with your house, and it cannot be changed by a third party that was not involved in the original mortgage agreement, right? So it would be like a car dealership stepping in and changing your, your mortgage. They have no authority to change that agreed upon mortgage contract between you and your lender. The only people that can change that agreement are the people who made the original contract. 
So in this in this instance, it's a contract or a, a, a covenant between Abraham and God. Moses cannot come along and change that, but that's what the Judaizers are thinking. So nothing can be added. Nothing can be taken away from an agreement. Now, if that would happen, that would be what? A label. It's no longer a non binding contract. And if it's so between humans and humans in those terms, in our terms here, how much greater is that contract between God and Abraham? So, who can step in and change God's contract? promises. Now let's magnify this a little bit more. There's Basically, there's two types of uh, agreements, right? First, there's a conditional or what they call a bilateral covenant, meaning um, and, well, and then there's a second, which is an unconditional uh, or a unilateral covenant. So, any agreement with two parties is considered conditional or bilateral, okay? Take the house mortgage that we just talked about, okay? There's, there's conditions on there. You, each party has to perform something. So that is an agreement that is binding on both parties for its fulfillment. Both parties agree to certain conditions. Either if either of the parties fail, the responsibilities, the covenant, or that promise, the contract is broken, and neither party has to fulfill the expectations of that agreement. Now, an unconditional or unilateral covenant is agreement between two parties, but only one of the two parties has to do something. Nothing is required by the other party. Remember when we read that? I will, I will, I will. That was God taking that responsibility of the contract. So the covenant between Abraham and God was an unconditional contract. Like I said, only one of the two parties had to uphold an agreement. And we see that covenant was unconditional when we look at the scriptures that tell about this event, right, that we just read. Now, there was a ceremony. And that's in Genesis 15. And this ceremony indicates that these this is an unconditional covenant. Now, let's look at chapter 15 of Genesis. It says, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my state is Eliza of Damascus? And Abraham said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir. But a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he was credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans, to give you this land, take possession of it. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, one with a dove and a young pigeon. Abraham bought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The bird, however, he did not cut in half. The birds of prey came down on the carcass, but Abraham drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abraham fell asleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. 
Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that there are four hundred years your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nations they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with, a great, with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the, sins of, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun has set and darkness had fallen, a smoking pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, To your sons I give this land, and from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river of the Euphrates. We can stop there. So here we see that God makes a covenant with Abraham. Notice so that God had no conditions for Abraham in his covenant. Every promise in this covenant is being upheld on God's shoulders alone. There's no conditions. And all those also notice that Abraham slept through this. When a covenant was dependent upon both parties being committed, being committed, right? Then both parties would pass between these pieces of uh, animals that were cut in half. So let's say there was a cow, there was what, a goat, and some birds. So they would cut the cow in half, half it would be here, half on this side, half of a goat, half a goat, right? And, you, and they would form like a, an aisle, and they would walk between the aisle hand in hand because that meant that they are uh, this is the covenant, and it takes both halves to make an agreement. So that's why they would walk through the middle. But like I said, Abraham fell asleep, right? God put him to sleep for a little while. Now, just 15, God alone, he moves through the halves of the animals by himself. Abraham's in this deep sleep. So God's solitary action in this indicates that the covenant is God's covenant. He alone will uphold it. God binds it to himself. He binds himself to this covenant. And God determined to call out a special people for himself, right? And we see that in Genesis 15. And through that special people, he would bless the whole world with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Then later on, God, he reiterates, right? He reiterates this Abraham covenant to Isaac and then later to his son Jacob, whose name God changes to Israel. So all the earth would be blessed through Abraham. So God made promises. It was not Abraham making promises to God. This was fully on God's shoulders. Verse 16 says, The promises were spoken to Abraham to his seed. Scripture does not say, and two seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person, Jesus Christ. Now this promise, if you remember, was made to Abraham's seed, meaning Jesus. So think about this. If this is an unconditional agreement between Abraham and Abraham's seed, right? God, Jesus. Abraham is held accountable to nothing in this agreement. God alone ratifies this agreement. The only ones who can change anything with this covenant promise are God the Father and Jesus the seed. Moses' law cannot alter this covenant. And that's what Paul is arguing about. Moses' law, they cannot add to the covenant with Abraham. Moses' law cannot take away from this covenant with Abraham. And Paul's argument is that the Judaizers are adding into God's grace and he's taking away from God's promise. 
That's going to be the garden. Now, this wouldn't work in any earthly courtroom, basically, is what Paul's saying. So what makes you Judaizers think that this would work in a court of a perfect and a holy, uncorrupt, heavenly judge? You Judaizers, you had no part in this covenant agreement. And you have no right to come along and change it now. But they're Judaizers, right? They liked all that mystical stuff. So maybe their next question is, but what if the revelation of the law was greater and was more glorious than the promise? Right? Here's what he says in 19. Why then will this law be hung it up? It was added because of transgressions until the seed, Jesus, right? To whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies that more than one party, but God is one. Now recall what it was like when the law was given to Moses, right? I kind of gave that away a little bit in my lame demonstration, right? Look in Exodus 19, verse 16 through 22. And it tells us this. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke built up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and a voice of God answered him. And the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people so that they do not force their way through to see the Lord, and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out against them. That's a rather dramatic entrance to the law, isn't it? Especially if you compare it to the giving of the promise to Abraham. The law was presented with, with smoke, thunder, lightning, uh, it was ground shaking. Everybody is trembling in fear. It was an impressive display. But Paul says the law is inferior to the covenant process, the promises. In verse 19, he says, Why then must he get that law given? Now, and it says, it was added because of transgressions until Jesus arrived. The law came about because of Israel's sin. And it only, and it was only on a temporary basis until Jesus, the seed, arrived. It's a temporary thing. And temporary cannot be greater than a permanent covenant. The law was meant to distinguish Israel from the pagan nations around them when they were uh, out in the wilderness, right? The, the law glorified a holy and pure God. Because they were going to come up, up uh, and be uh, opposed against them by, by false gods from all these other nations that surrounded them. Beside that, with the law, there has to be conditions, right? And they have to be met. And that part of that condition, though, is that you have to do something. You're to do something. You're, you're to hold up that agreement. It's either do it or you die. That's about it. But we know it's physically impossible to hold up any part of the law. So if a party is unable to perform the requirements of the contract, it's void. So why would you hang your hat on something so 
power of blood shed. Now, the confusing part. Verse 19. The law was given for angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party to God is one. Verse 20, right? What in the world does that mean? When the law was given to Israel, God had done it by means of angels and through the mediation of Moses, right? So Israel received the law kind of third hand, I guess you could say. Meaning, it went from God to the angels to Moses to Israel. So angels and Moses are mediators kind of, right? They're passing it from one to the next. And we see that confirmed here in Acts chapter 7 verses 50 through 55 where it confirms what Paul is saying. It says, has not my hand made these things? You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. The second confirmation is in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2. It says, For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment. Moses received the law from God from Mount Sinai. The involvement of the angels, it's incidental, it's they're God's representatives. They would have acted with his authority. So there's no real contradiction in it in other passages that say that God gave Moses the law directly, okay? Galatians, Acts, and Hebrews confirm the angels had a part in these events. So it's kind of like saying, I, I gave a, a letter to my friend, right? When in reality, the, mail, the mailman, he put it in your box, right? He was kind of the mediator in between. Now, contrast how the law was given with mediators. With how Abraham was given this promise, God directly gave it without any mediators to Abraham. It was personally delivered. So instead of putting it in a mailbox, he walked over and handed it to him. Mediators are in the middle of two parties in order to reach an agreement or to come to an agreement. But Abraham, there was no mediator since God was entering a covenant with Abraham. It was not Abraham entering an agreement with God. The conclusion Paul comes to in this argument is that the law, it's inferior to the covenant. The law was a covenant between two parties, God and Israel. God was represented in this uh, with the law, this by angels. Israel was represented by Moses. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. So the covenant agreement was this: if I said law agreement. If Israel would keep God's commands, he would bless them. If people disobeyed God, it would curse or punish them. Okay? It's always on an if. It was a two-way covenant. That's an impossible situation, though, and God knew that. He cannot uphold the law. It's impossible. So the law was to show Israel and us just how high God's standards are and just how low our standards are. It's that contrast between black and white, right? The law says, like I said before, do it or die. But on the other hand, there was a promise for those who believe in God and they trust in his promises. And that's us, right? It's a promise that reflects God's grace. 
just like we just sang about. It requires nothing from man that rests solely on God the Father's shoulders. So rejoice in your salvation. Thank the Lord today for the grace that he's given you. Like our song said, grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. So it's rather con kind of confusing subject, but what I got to walk away with is that uh, Abraham had a covenant with God, and that overrode the temporariness of the law. So that... Uh, Promise has never been broken, so it extends all the way to us as believers, just like Abraham. So let's pray. Great and glorious Father, we thank you. Um, this is a difficult one to, to try and teach, um, and I thank you for helping me with this. Um, and I pray, Lord, that uh, it was understood. I pray, Lord, that understanding these things and that it just really shows what you have done for us. And that sometimes we just look at things so simply and that we're afraid to learn more. And I thank you for stretching us, uh, causing us to go underneath the water and hold our breath a little bit longer and, and really dig a little bit deeper into your word, Lord. And those are the things that help us to defend our faith and have an answer when we need it. And Lord, your word constantly is supplying us. We ask, Lord, that you keep feeding us, that you keep causing and desiring us to know you better. Knowing that, Lord, that we don't take advantage of that grace. It's not a license for us to go and do what we want. So we ask that your Holy Spirit would be extra sensitive in us that it starts pointing out sin in our life and the things that you desire us to change. That you give us the power to change and the desire to change because of our great love for you. And Lord, please help us. And if you help us, Lord, we will be helped. There is no doubt. And this we ask and we pray through our Lord's name. Amen.